would you want your presentation to be? I think you said 30, 35 minutes or something? Yeah, 30, 35 minutes, up to 40 minutes is good. So uh, it gives us really great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Ravinder Kaur, who holds the Associate Professorship of Modern South Asia at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, she is also the director of the Center for Global South Asian Studies. And I must say that I've had the good fortune of visiting her in Copenhagen. There's an excellent establishment. We had a very good interdisciplinary conference. As all of you are well aware, she has a very serious book on the partition. And this present book, which I am planning to get my hands on, uh, is of uh, real interest to me because I have done some work on India's globalization. Uh, and Professor Kaur is making a strong argument that branding the nation and branding globalization in a certain way with respect to India's globalization has implications for thinking about India as a nation. So I think that's where uh, my curiosity lies how she is planning to connect the branding of India as a nation with its strategy of globalization. And before I hand over the floor to Professor Kaur, I'm also delighted to note that Dr. Christian Wagner has uh, joined us. Hello, Christian, how are you? Fine, thank you, Rahul. Thanks for the opportunity and the wonderful uh, lecture series. No, we hope to invite you also next time. I have been... Uh, I've been threatening you, but you know, next term we will we will finalize the date. Thank you. So over to you then, uh, Ravinder. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rahul, and all the colleagues at Edinburgh. I mean, I'm very thankful that you invited me here. So I think, much without much ado, I straight want to get to the heart of my talk, or the book itself, which is. What I have been investigating is that what does it mean for a nation to open up in the global economy or to become an emerging market or investment destination for global capital? I mean, this is this this is this has to do with India's nation, but I must add that this it, this goes beyond India. Some of these arguments can be made also for the wider, you know, third world nations or the old third world, developing world, which has undergone quite a transformation in the last few years. So the argument which I'm going to present basically is that uh, while for many, of, many people have said that uh, the rise of nationalism is a kind of uh, counterforce to globalization, what I want to propose is that it may not be so, that the kind of particular form of nationalism that we witness in the early 21st century is somehow aligned with global capital. And this is what I'm going to speak about. So the early 1990 was a moment of fragile hope and anxiety in India. The nation had just opened up its economy to join the world of free markets, a post Cold War end of history world of global free markets. The formula proved seductive. It held out the promise of foreign investment, high economic growth, and of unleashing the Ahithoto cage spirit of Indian enterprise. It also promised more consumer choices to Indian citizens, dreams of a better life, and most of all, a chance to set the nation's course to resplendent 21st century futures. The forward march to market liberalization entailed a breakaway from India's old legacy of economic nationalism too, that is India's anti-colonial economics of Swadeshi, uh, which had dominated Indian economic policy and thinking since national independence, and it prioritized autonomy over the nation's resources. The boycott of foreign-made goods was the most popular expression of Swadeshi politics. But in the 1990s, the Swadeshi began to be opended, even seen as a vestige of the past, holding back India from economic prosperity. New Indian economic policy in 1990s threw open the consumer market to Indian uh, to foreign goods. Swadeshi school economic thinkers termed it as coca colonization of India. 
Coca-Cola in this dramatic trans transition to free market capitalism, at once became a sign of worldly pleasures now available uh, to Indian consumers, as well as the treachery of selling out to foreign corporations. Recall that in 1977, Coca-Cola had been banned by the Indian state. The company was subsequently turned into a nationalist venture that sold an Indian brand of soft drinks. A quarter of a century later in 1993, Coca-Cola was not only back in the newly liberalized India, it had also bought the Indian brand to expand its operations in the market. The corporate sale of the Indian soft drinks brand to Coca-Cola was an illustration of how the logic of liberalization and globalization had displaced the principles of Swadeshi economic nationalism. The free market lobby, it was ruefully remarked, had, I quote, sold out to big business, unquote, and sullied India's anti-colonial dream of economic independence. Though the advocates of Swadeshi and socialist contested liberalization in the early 1990s, few had grasped the full consequences of India's transition to free market capitalism. At this point, that is early 1990s, the socialist and Swadeshi resistance aimed to prevent the opening of Indian consumer market to foreign goods or foreign takeover of Indian companies. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Ravinder, we can hear yeah, you. Because, yes. Yeah, because uh, it said that host has muted you, so. <laughs> All right, okay. Yet liberalization of India proved more than the question of consumer goods or companies. The nation state, and this is the argument that I would like you to consider, that the nation state in the 21st century global economy was itself undergoing a capitalist transformation into a lucrative commodity. That is an enclosure of global capital. Already in the 1990s, India had begun courting foreign capital to rejuvenate its economy through global investment programs. What initially began as a push to sell made in India goods in global markets would soon turn into a make in India project that sought to reconfigure India as a veritable factory of the world for global manufacturing. At the turn of the millennium, a historic publicity campaign called India Shining launched India as an investment hotspot in the global markets. The mediatized projection of India, just a second here, a uh, projection of India disclosed the inner workings of how India was being reorganized as a market. The campaign named Shine, India Shining was more than just publicist publicists hyperbole, it was an accurate description of post-colonial India's transition to capitalism. The shining metaphor promised India's great transformation into a brand new nation, that is a refuge for global capital made available through state-led investment programs. The infusion of capital made India shine in the theater of world economy, a luster kept alive by profits the investors hoped to generate. It entailed too a transformation of the nation into a fully capitalized income generating asset, or in the language of policy experts, structural adjustments and lowering of trade barriers, aided and abetted by global financial institutions and facilitated by the state. This move altered the old compact between the nation and state. Once structurally adjusted, the nation became a site of production, its territory a reserve of untapped natural resources, its population a demographic dividend that both produced and consumed, and its culture a unique brand identity. The great state power rearranged the nation as a market-ready investment destination. The glue that has long held the nation and the state together now, was, now became the optimistic vision of economic growth and prosperity the erasure of the colonial shame and even restoration of a mythical golden Hindu past. The past decade or so, the Indian nation brand identity has increasingly foregrounded an ancient Hindu past to fashion a unique cultural identity in the global economy. What began as a soft power push to overhaul India's image in the world in the 1990s eventually became uh, an instrument to strengthen, as I will show, 
the Hindu nationalist claims to represent the authentic pre-Muslim spirit of the nation. The ongoing transformation of the nation state provides yet another counter example to the enduring myth of the extinction of the nation state in the flat world of free markets. Proponents long imagine globalization, that is shorthand for unrestrained mobility of capital, goods, people, and ideas as a world in motion, an open-ended market trade, sans barriers making national borders superfluous. The story of globalization itself has been told in the language of movements, flows, motions, networks, mobility, circulation, and fluidity, all to conjure a world permanently on the move. The India shining imagery of which this is one of the most iconic pictures discloses something often overlooked in the euphoria of globalization. That is nation state had not only defied the predictions of its end, it was undergoing a spectacular makeover to become a capitalist growth story in the global economy. The nation state in its commodity form was maintaining its role as a key actor despite procrastinations of its retirement. This shift becomes especially apparent in the old third world, which at the turn of the millennium was imagined by global financial institutions and investors as a frontier market. Please look at some of these uh, covers of the economies, for example, um, uh, as a frontier emerging market in the capitalist geography. The turning point was the 1990s triumph of liberalism in Euro-America that energized the contentious project of neoliberal reforms in the global South. With the counterweight of, co of communism gone, the script of liberal economic reforms was pitched as the only viable future for the developing world. The post-colonial and post-communist nations were encouraged by think tanks and financial institutions to make structural adjustments and open up their markets to foreign capital investments. This formula not only promised economic prosperity to the post colony, but also a chance to fulfill its future as a great power to win a seat at the table of global politics. India was the forerunner among the post colonial nations that cautiously embraced the liberal project of capitalist reforms, a momentous event given its sheer complexity and size in the world economy. By the early 21st century, the liberalization of the Indian economy had been popularly dubbed as the India story or the India growth story of millennial capitalist growth that promised good times to the citizens and profits to the investors. The transformation of the nation form raises the question, what does it mean to love nation, this form of nation in the 21st century? To ask the question already seems an aberration, almost a sacrilege, given that the idea of the nation is at odds with commodification and market transaction. After all, the nation has long been imagined as a sacred object of worship, a dynamic moral spiritual project with a common history of love and suffering. The origins of 19th century cultural nationalism lay in the imagination of nations as, I quote, organic beings, living personalities, unquote, that demanded yes. sacrifice and <laughs> as a special kind of love that exceeded all others to sustain this virtual person. Nationalists presume the nation to be a unique person with inalienable civilizational essence and a timeless history and its territory personified as a sacred being. To love the nation then was to celebrate the spirit of the people, the national romance that embraced natural landscapes and its ethnic inhabitants. The ultimate expression of nationalism was martyrdom for its cause. For Indians engaged in the anti-colonial struggle, the figure of the mother goddess Bharat Mata, a feminine embodiment of India's territorial expanse, served as the sacred object of devotion and sacrifice. So how could the nation, sacred nation, be put at the disposal of investors in the market place? The answer is counterintuitive, I propose. What renders the nation transcendental and open to exchange in the market is the imagining, imagination of the nation as a living organism, a unique being that can be dressed up as a branded investment destination. If the natural landscape is full of untapped natural resources and the people are consumers and producers, 
the nation's cultural identity is turned into a corporate brand identity. To love and be devoted to the nation then means to work to enhance the brand value and economic potential of the nation. It means adding value to the nation by project, projecting it as a profitable, market-ready investment destination. The logic of 19th century cultural nationalism is turned upside down. Far from corroding the celebrated spirit of the nation, it's the nation's market value as a profit-generating commercial enclosure, which becomes a mode of affirming the worthiness of the people as a great nation. The more the brand new nation attracts and generates capital, the more it legitimizes its aura. The claims of a sense identity as the chosen people and natural ties with the landscape. The infusion of capital continually generates something that exceeds capital, the aura, spirit, or the non-extractable difference that is plowed back to generate brand capital. In short, the cultural difference distilled into a corporate brand is put to work to generate, generate capital, and capital in return enhances the claim of cultural uniqueness. The commodification of the nation consecrates to the very idea of state sovereignty in ever new forms. The visual power to celebrate the revitalized nation and to see and show the national territory and its population as valuable factors of production available to global capital. Consider the Brand India publicity material, which mostly appears as a repackaging of the familiar cultural exotica, from yoga to wildlife, color colorful festivals to Ayurveda, all in global aesthetics for its consumers in India and the world. Yet, what is crucial to this cultural politics of brand making is not ju just that what is inside the image frame, but what is kept outside of it. The near absence of Muslim figures or symbols in the brand in India imagery. It's an omission that creates a default Hindu cultural frame, frame, mainframe through which to see and show India. There is an exception, however, to, to this imagery. I, I just like, just want you to see these are some of the uh, you know, old familiar ads from India Shining here. If there is an exception to this trend, it is the contentious presence of Taj Mahal, the 16th century Mughal monument built in Indo-Islamic style. On the cultural battlefield of Hindu nationalism, Taj Mahal is deemed a trace of the foreign and inauthentic representation of India in the world. It is a permanent thorn in Hindu nationalist politics, but one that cannot easily be evicted from India, uh, from brand India. The monument is not only India's prime tourist attraction, but also a world heritage site that generates steady profits. In a strange twist then, it is not the secular politics of multiculturalism, but the capitalist logic of profit making that allows the precarious presence of Taj Mahal within brand India. The capitalist logic of brand India then extends beyond selling the nation to investors. It has not only furthered the Hindu nationalist agenda to create a unified cultural identity, it has also rearranged the social political landscape. Critical to this transformation is how brand making opens up a fractious politics of visual re-territorialization of the nation. Who are the chosen people who inhabit the visual surface of the nation brand? Which cultural practices and ideas are left out of the frame, concealed from the eyes of the world? Who owns the nation and its natural and cultural positions? And who has the power to capitalize these positions? If the visual frame of the nation brand is a form of public re recognition of the nation's cultural essence, then that unique difference acquires legitimacy precisely by being chosen for illumination by the state. It is here the brand India imagery assumes significance. The predominant choice of pre-Muslim Hindu cultural practices in the image frame eventually becomes a cultural mainframe of the nation. The very act of illumination of cultural Hinduism as symbolic of modern India marginalizes all other religious groups and multicultural identity shaped in post-colonial India. Witness how the idea of India and Hinduism is increasingly conflated in public imagination. The secular and egalitarian roots of the old anti-colonial nationalism 
uh, are giving away to unabashed Hindu nationalism that neither brooks dissent nor is willing to share power with the minority groups. The state as the image machine put simply asserts its power by claiming proprietary control over the material and cultural possessions of the nation, and more importantly, the power to market them to global investors. This control clearly demarcates the domestic affairs as a forbidden territory for external actors. The tacit bargain is this, the state manages and facilitates capital mobility and in return, retains the power to rearrange the domestic sphere without external interference or sanctions. I'll give you an example of this transaction, which became one of the examples is which became apparent in August 2019 when the Indian government revoked the special autonomous status of Kashmir. Two developments took place simultaneously. The region was shut down in a curfew and internet blackout to stymie political protests and at the same time opened up for business uh, uh, to global investors. The revocation was accompanied by an official announcement. I think very few people noticed that there were two announcements which were made. One was a revocation of the special status. The other, that there would be an investor summit where the government would invite to witness firsthand, I quote, the business friendly policies of the government, assess infrastructure, natural resources, raw material and skilled and unskilled manpower and identify business opportunities in the state." Unquote. This is from an official brochure. If the prospect of accessing a new market, uh, an untapped, untapped site of production and uh, consumption was welcomed by the Indian capital, the foreign capital and policymakers chose to overlook this act for the fear of losing Indian market. It is hardly, hardly a surprise then that India's march to become the factory of the world, a global space of production that contains natural resources, cheap skilled labor, technology, as well as a vast consumer market, is deeply entangled with pro-capital Hindu majoritarianism. At the heart of this alliance is the pursuit of economic growth, a project that calls for discipline, even obedience to the, to the strongman leader who means business in more ways than one. This strongman appeal of Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India, as a hyper-masculine Hindu leader is what first earned him endorsement of the captains of industry. The capital has indeed always rooted for authoritarian leaders who can not only capture resources and put them at the disposal of investors, but also ensure a permanent supply of good news to celebrate the growth story of the nation. This is where the domains of politics, economy, and publicity come together to shape the contours of pro-capital Hindu nationalism. The special kind of love for the brand new nation requires a steady channeling of positive, uplifting images in the global public sphere. It also means overlooking and countering negative images that might harm the nation's brand value in the world. This need for compulsory good news to keep optimism alive is at odds with the structures of democracy. After all, the heart of democracy is dissent, a practice that involves criticism, disagreement, and even expressions of disobedience. This contradiction has created a rupture and a new political category of dissidents, we all know, anti-nationals, which appears through the logic of the brand the anti-nationals are the ones who corrode the brand value of the nation by exposing the negatives, the communal violence, caste atrocities, and poverty, otherwise buried beneath the good news. So I'm going to bring my talk to an end. Just wanted to show this, this image is from the World Economic Forum in Davos, where I made much of my field work. You will recognize many of the figures. These are the billionaires of the nation. This is the image I wanted to show you. This is an unusual image which stands out in the spectacular catalog of Brand India. It's an adver advertisement that sells in India to the global investors, but barely mentions it. Yet in doing so, it captures a key transformative moment in the making of 21st century nation and nationalism from the embers of globalization. Now look at the image frame. Designed in early 2004, the advertisement reproduces an old drawing titled Columbus Discovers America 1492, 
with a bold new caption, the last time we held so much promise, Columbus discovered America, unquote. It features an artistic portrayal of Christopher Columbus's arrival on the shores of the new world. Columbus and his crew are depicted as overjoyed and exhausted, thankful for having found the land of promise after a long, arduous journey. The text accompanying the drawing reads, I quote, when Columbus set sail to find the rich spices of our land, destiny had other plans. Instead of finding us, he discovered America. Years later, modern day explorers have got our incredible land back on their maps because today we are among the globe's fastest growing economies and opportunities are endless for global corporate captains, investors, marketers, exporters, and tourists. The weather today is just perfect to sail for our beautiful shores. Our country is shining and you have never had a better time to shine together. This is the poetry of economics. I unquote, the hint that this uh, this bountiful land of opportunity was India, was the discreet presence of icons of the national flag and the official emblem, you can see here, and the website address www.indiashining.com at the bottom. The poetic invitation of India shining to sail for our beautiful shores was designed to draw the attention of a powerful consumer group, global investors and policymakers to India. It was witty, and effective in the highly speculative arena of finance capital, where post-colonial nations turned emerging markets competed for foreign investments. The sales pitch was direct. India, the old profitable commodity, was once again available in the global market marketplace. The visual sign of India's ongoing commodification into an investment destination was the presence of Columbus. Here, Columbus served to rekindle the old desire for legendary India that had once moved Europeans to undertake a dangerous expedition across the ocean. India shining promised investors they could succeed where Columbus and other Europeans of the age of discovery had failed. They could tap in, into India's great resources and wealth. India may have eluded Columbus, but it was now inviting capital to the great price. I'll just stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Ravinder, for that excellent, crisp, and very powerful message that I'm sure has come out of your book. When you were thinking, when you were talking about Columbus, I was thinking about also the East India Company. Yes. So there was once the Christopher Columbus, uh, and then there was also uh, the East India Company. So. Uh, uh, I, I just wanted to say that as a, a kind of to, to lightly, uh, there, there are already 66 people in the audience and I'm sure there are lots of people who have questions. Uh, I don't see any hands, but if there are people who want to jump in with a question right away, uh, the floor is yours. Once I begin to see hands, I will certainly, yes. Basically, what uh, Professor Kaur has outlined very clearly and succinctly is a powerful argument that cultural nationalism and the globalization project go together. And uh, India's globalization project has become intenser and its project of cultural nationalism has also become more and more intense. Now this, as you, have, as you can see, has been uh, described very nicely. And we now welcome comments, questions, uh, and any other Is sorts hand of here? Can you, can you see whose hand is up? Yes, I think it's Christian Vauna. Okay, please come in. I, I can somehow not see the hand. Yes, thank you very much, Rab Rabinda, for, um, oh. for um, recognizing my hand. Thanks for the presentation. I have a question. Um, when you read the, the basics of uh, uh, Hindutva, the, the 
ideology has nothing to, or is hardly linked to economic issues. When you read Goivalka or Savaka, you know all the basics. So it's not, not very much linked. It's more like cultural, ethnic kind of nationalism. So what is the debate or what is your, your view on the debate within the Hindutva com community, how to reconcile, let's say, these global pro-capitalist forces on the one hand and a very conservative, very cultural-oriented uh, uh, part of Hindutva, which are there in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, in the original writing. Thank you. Uh, Rahul, shall I answer now? Uh, uh, you can you can certainly answer, but I just I just add a, a supplementary to that, uh, which is that the, in the recent past we are actually beginning to see a closure of the economy uh, to such an extent that even Professor Jagdish Bhagwati and Arvind Panagaria, who are actually very fond of Mr. Modi, have been by and large been kind of very very supportive of his policies otherwise, but in a not so subtle way. Uh, uh, they are also trying to suggest that uh, Mr. Modi is not uh, certainly moving in the direction of globalization. So this is kind of related to Christian's question. And there, there, is, a, there is a huge element within the, the RSS and the Swadeshi Jagran Manch, which was actually very powerful when Yashwan Sinha became finance minister in 1998. And the power of that lobby was so strong that the 1998 budget is actually called the rollback budget. And then subsequently, uh, political economists have noted, like Baldev Raj Nair and even journalists like Poranjoy Go Thakurda have noted, that it went to Vajpayee's credit that he could actually marginalize those sections to a much greater extent. And subsequently, Yashpur. Sena himself changed his mind about globalization and Vajpayee's uh, really favorite finance minister was just one thing and he could be brought back against RSS pressure. So, so these are some of the dialectics that are playing themselves within the regime and I was thinking that since Christian has already asked the question, how would you respond to such dialectics? I think uh... There are, first of all, thank you very much for these questions, because I think at first sight, as we all know, this all seems extremely uh, opposed to each other. You know, the whole discourse of uh, Hindu cultural nationalism and very actually illiberal and conservative thought and which goes along with this whole question of globalization, which, which is the language of movements and flows and something which is unstoppable and something which we have all become used to since 1990s. So I think uh, the two answers uh, to your question would be that, first of all, if you go back to the archives in 1990s, early 90s, uh, it was not just RSS, but also the whole socialist groups within Indian politics, they were opposed uh, to, you know, variously liberalization, privatization, globalization. And uh, at that time, they were not taken very seriously. They were seen as marginal to the whole pro political project. Uh, but then something changes later on, and it begins happening when, um, you know, uh, within RSS, uh, it, like it is that group is marginalized, as Rahul has already mentioned. The new alliance which emerges is between free market capitalism and the old project of Hindutva. And without this alliance, actually, uh, Mr. Modi would have never happened. Because the clear manifestation of uh, this alliance basically is what is known as Gujarat model. And uh, this is where you begin to see that, uh, uh, which Christoph Jafilov, among many others, has you know, uh, explained or described for us, that almost immediately after the violence took place in Gujarat, two things happened. One thing was that uh, Mr. Modi began taking out uh, these mass rallies where he, uh, you know, coordinated himself as the Hindu Hrede Samraj, uh, Samrat, the emperor of Hindu hearts. And at the same time, a few months later, there was something called Gujarat Summit, uh, sorry, Vibrant Gujarat, it was called. And these two things have become the thing. I mean, if today, I mean, you can see that whole pattern is being repeated again and again. 
today, if you read newspapers, you would see um, in Uttar Pradesh, uh, a, a Yogi Adityanath is being pitched similarly as the transformative figure. And there are huge newspaper ads which promote him as both as the, you know, the Hindu savior, as well as the economic uh, transform. Actually, Noida is pitched as the hub, the place where a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, these high tech, green growth, you know, all those kind of terms, which you would hear in posh policy think tank circuits. On one hand, uh, they are mentioned. And on the other hand, you would see that the first act that uh, Yogi Adityanath undertakes uh, you know, when the lockdown is announced in India is to go and do a puja, like a ceremony, a ritual ceremony in a temple. So what seems at first contradictory, what I'm trying to propose in my book is to say, well, 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 hold on. We are used to thinking about our entire discourse is framed in terms of globalization movement and nationalism, which is seen as its opposite. What I'm trying to show is, well, this kind of hyper-nationalist expression would have never found any currency had it not been pitched together with the more uh, you know, middle-class, liberal, think tank kind of operations. Because it's, it's, it's very well known, if you speak to middle-class people in India, educated types, uh, they, would, they would tell you that, but you see, it's all okay because growth is happening. But of course, it's a different story that uh, Mr. Modi turns out to be a bad manager of capital, the Indian economy has simply gone down the hill, right? So some of the, uh, some of the uh, uh, disenchantment with the project also arises from the fact that uh, it's all okay with the cultural nationalist project, but he's not delivering growth. So if you read a lot of these opinion columns, uh, uh, this is the way disenchantment is being expressed. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, do you have a counter question, Christian? Or is... There is then I can see uh, I can see a chat message and then there is also a question by I think Professor Kanungo. Uh, so there are a couple of questions here. I'll just, you, you wanted to have a counter qu a question, uh, Christian? Okay. Uh, so there is, uh, there is, Aishika Mitra, who says, do you have other instances of cultural nationalism that come up as only as the Indian nationalism? Do you feel that White House nationalism, especially that of America is following a similar pattern? Uh, then she says, the clash between the idea of globalization and political ideology was seen in the pattern of CPIM working in West Bengal. Uh, we actually have a paper on that. Hiban uh, Shujha uh, and I have a paper on the decline of the CPIM. Uh, then Asha Chadda has a question which says that the government bans popular Chinese apps. Does it not hamper their project of perpetual good news? How do such knee-jerk reactions reconcile with their project of attracting investors? Now, there are other questions, but I'll stop here. Uh, I will request... Professor Kanungo to ask his question and then we can move ahead. Hello, Ravinda, many congratulations on Thank your you book. Thank you so much. Well, I haven't gone through it and, and also I enjoyed your talk. Well, I, I don't know exactly whether, you know, I can ask questions, but the comments and questions clubbed together. Let, let, me, let me just uh, tell everyone that Professor Kanungo has actually probably the best book written on the RSS. So no, 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 <laughs> not at all. It should all be very <laughs> No, no, this is uh, in replying no, to Professor Kahn. I, I wrote the long back, you know, like uh, two decades before. So anyway, so now I think this is a very interesting, but I have little different observation. Like you have brought in, of course, you know, this is in the book, as I understand, you know, you have brought so many things together, like India signing campaign is very different, little different from incredible India, yeah. right? And the present regime is again, kind of, you know, like different from the 1998, 2004 regime. Mm -hmm. And 1977, as you rightly mentioned that it's actually a socialist and Jansang combined together, throwing out uh, more a socialist kind, right? IBM and Coca-Cola were 
thrown out of India. Mm -hmm. But till 77, again, there was a consensus. So the Coca-Cola and IBM survived in India, in Nehruvian India. So, so the idea is that the 77 is a different kind of understanding of economy. There is a class between the Nehruvian economy and the Gandhian economy, not really Hindu nationalist economy, where actually, you know, uh, the privileging of Gandhian economy, like Charan Singh and Madhuli Mai and others actually bringing in these ideas. So my, I in a way see the kind of sense of continuum mm. rather than a kind of break. Uh, so all these years, if you are mentioning Noida, who created Noida? I mean, obviously it was designed to have this kind of, so there was infrastructure, there was a kind of consensus to bring in capital, right? to create these industrial clusters. Now Hindu nationalism is giving a different spin altogether. Mm -hmm. So the question is that I have some questions of whether really the branding, cultural branding really bring in investment. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, is it really cult through culture? Okay, there have been branding, Nehru had branded. We were a soft power that was also a branding, right? And uh, now China is becoming a software. It is actually rebranding in a way, differently branding itself. And so whether, so we already branded, but what Modi has done instead of making it a kind of, you know, so it has brought out, magnified the idea of yoga, hmm. making it a different kind of soft power, which will actually, uh, you know, more modernize, more globalize and so it is giving a different kind of spin to the whole project, which was already there, you know, to be exploited, to be maneuvered, to be, you know, expanded. So this is one of my understanding because I think investors are not so kind of uh, naive that they'll come primarily because of branding. Like you mentioned a very interesting point that, and the question of Kashmir, I think Hindu nationalism is very, very intelligent in the sense that Look, 370, Kashmir, you know, special status was taken away. But what it has brought in, which is again very controversial, Article 35A, you are now allowing investors that, okay, now you can buy land in uh, Kashmir, which was denied before. So many Indian investors, big corporates think that, look, Kashmir is a place, it can be Switzerland, we can actually invest more, we can buy land. So it could be a new experiment and the state can provide us security. Mm -hmm. So the state is becoming saying that, look, we are not a soft state. We are a hard state. We'll give you kind of, you know, possibilities. But through this, of course, you know, like it is uh, uh, enticing its own constituency, internal constituency, and mm -hmm. also making a kind of, you know, showing that, you know, it is favorable to global power, but there are contradictions. I mean, these contradictions are coming very sharply, right? And uh, to what extent the cultural blending and global capital could really coexist, could remain in alignment is a big question. So this is my observation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I think uh, there are so much uh, no, 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 to talk just, about. I'm just problems, going to just for my pick up one or two things. First of all, I think um, we should not think about branding operation that I'm uh, laying out in terms of, uh, does it bring investments? I think a lot of people think about that. What does, what does it really bring? How many billions have come in? And this is what the government also likes to say, but look, our forex, foreign exchange reserves have grown so much, et cetera. I think the important thing for us as political theorists would be, what work does the branding operation actually perform in the political landscape? And here I, would, I should also, uh, emphasize that often we think about uh, publicity, branding, soft power, primarily in external terms, right? Much of the literature which has come out on soft power has to do with international politics. But what you see here is what is often overlooked is how it rearranges the contours of the nation state itself. So India is not the same as it was in 1970s, 1990s, 2004, 2000, you know, so on and so forth how it has been rearranged inside because for instance much of what you saw in india shining campaign it was actually intended for indians living in india 
though that's one of the chapters which I'm describing uh, that what was the logic uh, which brought about. And basically uh, the work of capital should not be just thought in economic terms in terms of like money, like what is like, what is the material gain out of it? What basically does it if you take the China model, for instance, which is that the fact that you have economic power allows you to flex your muscles in more ways than one. And uh, which actually connects to one of the earlier questions that are there other examples of uh, such kind of alignment of cultural nationalism uh, and capitalism, uh, which actually you can see in many parts of the world. The fact that you have economic power, that you can dictate terms in some way, uh, this is precisely what India wants to emulate. It has been trying to emulate. So China in a way has become that model. Um, and and, and uh, I have to say for all that anti-China rhetoric, when you see Indian, in, Indian policymaking, it really wants to you know, be that, to fill in that gap, that spot. And the second thing uh, I would say is that um, we live in the age of Narendra Modi, right? It has been six years now. So our thinking process is very much shaped by like, it seems like the over, you know, it overwhelms us. But actually when you look back, what you can see as you have rightly pointed out, there are continuities here. And actually Mr. Modi is sitting atop all those developments which had, had been taking place. He has actually made political capital out of it which no other BJP leader has been able to make, right? Uh, not even Congress was able to make those kind of political gains because Congress had a different kind of cultural agenda, which was nevertheless still about secularism and multiculturalism. So he's sitting atop that. Now the greatest tragedy of all this story, this whole story, when we will be writing later on also would be that we will remember Narendra Modi's time also as the one where he has made the capital out of, out of all these economic gains, but he, you know, it is going downwards. I don't see how it is going to improve. And I think um, uh, the final thing I would mention is that yes, this bargain that we have witnessed in Kashmir where at one go such a huge decision was made to revoke uh, the, you know, uh, Article 370. But at the same time, the way to shut down everything, like shut down the, the dissent or uh, objection uh, happened in Kashmir to simply shut down the whole communication and movement. But the outside world, they're basically saying, well, you see, it's our domestic affair. It's our internal affair. And the way to do it is there is, you know, carrot and stick policy. But look here at what is at stake is this entire Indian market, right? So if you, uh, I've written a short piece about that and you can just see the statements on Confederation of Indian Industries or what is called India Inc. All the, all the capitalists immediately are on board. They say, well, this is totally okay. We will go and develop the region, right? It's not like as if development like wasn't happening or, you know, investments. So I think I'll, like there is much, we could actually have a separate huge conversation about that. And thank you so much. Just to quickly go to the other questions which were asked, uh, which one, something I have already hinted at, that uh, what we are witnessing in India is not an India phenomena exclusively. This is a wider phenomena. You can actually see, you know, I'll give you an example, a country like um, Rwanda, for example, in Africa, or, uh, you know, countries like Sri Lanka, for instance, you know, these are countries which are using foreign investments uh, or infrastructure development uh, in this region also as a means to overcome or to create some sort of consensus. And these two places are mentioned for you because there has been large scale violence also in these places in 1990s and later on in 2010. And uh, for some countries, uh, you know, pumping up your economic muscle has become a way to overcome internal dissent also. So it is no coincidence that in many parts of the world, you continue witnessing that more you think about this investment destination thing. I mean, in my book, I'm actually listing out all the you know, countries and their investment programs. Okay. It's a very long list. But at the same time, you also increasingly have a very so-called strong leader, strong authoritarian 
form of governance because these are the people who can, uh, you know, the leaders who can actually go and vacate land for you if you want to go and establish a special economic zone, for example. If you want to create some sort of new port or, you know, they can like throw away fishermen because these are the strong leaders. Right now in India, what is going on with the farmers protest? It is literally, we are seeing the political power to say, you know what, we can open up this sector. Right, so this is the tussle which is going on. So these are uh, uh, the connections. Have I forgotten anything else about this TikTok? And I mean, I think the Indian government has gotten carried away. I suppose, uh, you know, during the pandemic. Um, I mean, if all of us read the policy documents, which sometimes we're like, wow, what's happening here? And everyone knows uh, that actually uh, the trade has actually increased. Uh, India-China trade has increased rather than decreased. So these are symbolic things. This, uh, you know, shutting down TikTok and all those apps, it has hugely, uh, you know, delighted the internal constituency. But if you look at the trade figures, they don't match with uh, uh, these instances. Rahul, I can't hear you. There are a large number of questions. I will try to briefly. Uh, so one is by Devyani Bhosle, who says, says that how does cultural nationalism square up with the Brahmin Baniya partnership hegemony that we see in at the national level? Also, how is this seen as the example of the implementation of the new farmers bills in 2020? So this is her question. Then there is Abir Mazumdar who says, uh, hello, madam, uh, my sense about Indian nation state in the pre-2014 decades was, as you have presented, about welcoming capital through foreign investment. Now it does seem to be about disinvestment of state securities and investments. The current notion is an apparent loose aggregate of the government non-state actors who actively see this as welfareism only for a few and only for the upper caste and middle class Hindu. Welfareism is sabotaged by whoever the state labels anti-national, Islamist, etc. Then there is a question from Rachna to everyone saying uh, the ideology of the current government clearly promotes the idea of nationalism, but at the same time is capitalist. What kind of future are we headed to as a nation? And then Mubashir, Mubashir Shah says, Thank you, ma'am. The lecture was informative. Uh, minorities are minimized. Secularism is placed into question. Is there a debasement of the standard of law? What could be the results? Is India still the biggest majority rule government on the planet? And I think this is the last question from the chat that I will take, uh, which is that um, about how you would buy Aditi Saraf how would you consider the role of the Indian diaspora in creating brand India? And then there is a question by Rito Broto. Do you want to first take these and then should we <laughs> get to uh, the question that he wants to ask personally? Yes. Or do you want me to combine? That's, uh, no, no, this is already a lot. I have already, I'm, I'm, I hope okay. I will remember everything. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. So I think let's go with these. Then it will be Rito Broto and then there are more questions coming in. Yeah. Okay, so I'll begin with Aditi. Uh, and I think this is a very important question, uh, the role of diaspora. Uh, first of all, the whole notion of India as within the territory does not exist any longer. There is Indian diaspora, uh, you know, a very strong diaspora, especially in the US, uh, which is acting uh, unlike actually, I would say the diaspora in, the, in Europe. Um, you know, which, which has become a very strong actor and it has become the pro-government lobby. And in this case, actually, it is overwhelmingly uh, BJP uh, and RSS. And uh, it is very well established how overseas friends of BJP or HSS are working abroad to fulfill. Um, and uh, so these are strong lobby, uh, uh, you know, organizations. So I think uh, 
I would say that in the same way that there is a lot of it happens in the in the realm of discourse, which is about policing that are you saying anything negative about the country. And it becomes even more I have seen the the uh, distinction between inside and outside is that it is policed in a particular kind of way uh, in the diaspora. That um, it almost as as I think it was day before yesterday it was uh, Pravasi Bharatiya Divas. Uh, where um, uh, you know, Mr. Modi gave the speech that every Indian is uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, an ambassador for India, right? And this is very strongly inculcated. And I mention it in my book also that every citizen, like the role, this your duty as a citizen is also to continuously say good things about the nation. So, which is, as I'm saying, this is in inherently contradictory to the idea of branding, where you're supposed to spin the positive spin the whole time. Uh, and at the same time, democracy demands that uh, dissent is part of your discourse. So I think this is where, um, uh, but just to say that diasporic uh, policing is slightly different, uh, where you are seen as an ambassador of the nation in the outside world. And uh, which, um, uh, then Mubashir Shah is uh, mentioning rightly that in the last six years, what has increasingly happened is that majoritarianism has become almost, it has been normalized in a way that we don't even question anymore. I think it has happened, uh, you know, when it happened the first time. Uh, you know, this thing about that, uh, I think it started, it started taking shape with this whole question of beef eating or vegetarianism that people started right in the first term of uh, Mr. Modi, that uh, this thing about that, uh, who's, who eats what, the cultural, uh, you know, policing of food and consumption and all those things. And after that, it has simply been a roller coaster. So many things have happened and it has become so normalized that a few days ago, I was attending actually something in a think tank, uh, a policy discussion where actually people were pretty coolly discussing how the contours of the Hindu nation should be. So I think when it reaches that level, uh, you know, that majoritarianism is simply seen as, uh, you know, as the new normal, right? So uh, minorities, I mean, as, as we all know that uh, people will gleefully tell you that uh, BJP does not even count in its electoral arithmetic uh, whether Muslims are going to vote or not. It doesn't count at all. Uh, so of course uh, it is majoritarian, but majoritarian which no longer shocks anyone. And then I, then Rachna is, um, uh, the, uh, the idea of national, but at the same time, yeah, so it is, this is exactly what I've been trying to explain that yes, there is this alignment seemingly between two opposites, but here they perfectly uh, are, uh, you know, compatible with each other, which of course goes against the whole political theory making, which has told us, you know, that liberal markets, liberal politics go together. And this is why so many people have been confused. They don't know what to make of India. You know, a lot of political analysis, which is like, like, what do you do with it? Yes, but what I'm trying to show here is that, well, this entire notion, uh, we need to reconsider that because liberal, uh, illiberal politics uh, and liberal markets can perfectly cohere and actually even thrive, at least, you know, as I have mentioned before that uh, for a lot of capitalists, I mean, they love the idea of having a strong man authoritarian leader, because someone who can actually get things done. And as everyone knows, Mr. Modi's political appeal literally is that he can get things done. And this is what is playing out right now also. What is the future? Well, <laughs> we can all guess. Um, I mean, um, well, I'll, uh, that requires bringing out the crystal ball, which I will not do at the moment. And I think uh, uh, my sense about the Indian nation state, this is Abir Mazumdar. Um, now it does seem that I would, uh, well, I would say that disinvestment, if you're thinking of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, this whole thing about privatization that has been going on all along, but what is different maybe what is happening at this moment, I'm just mentioning the farmers protests which are going on, a lot of 
policy think tank people have been saying that this is a return of the 1991 moment. And I don't think so this is correct. Because 1991, I mean, as everyone knows, I mean, it started, I mean, Rahul has written fantastic uh, books about that. Uh, I'm sure Rahul, you would have something to say about that as, as well. Uh, uh, you know, that uh, it uh, did start, uh, you know, with these deregulation of the market, but at the same time, it was about a lot of emphasis was about, uh, you know, uh, you know, getting rid of some of, you know, the so-called white elephants and, and those kind of things. But I think what we are witnessing is a wholesale opening up of the agriculture sector in a very, very profound way. And I think, uh, this cannot be simply, this is not a rehearsal of what happened in 1990s. And also I would say that, uh, you know, the Manmohan Singh government actually learned the lesson uh, pretty early on that, uh, that opening up to the market, do you, does anybody recall that he had actually come up with a phrase called, uh, you know, human capitalism with human face. The fact that the Indian government had to think in those terms clearly showed that uh, there was a lot of introspection going on. That what 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 do these you know relentless market reforms actually do? And this was the same period when a number of uh, policy documents were um, commissioned, also uh, including the poverty. Uh, I'm just forgetting the you know for example Arjun Sen Gupta uh, committee report, which actually showed how devastating the level of poverty was, for instance. So a, a number of initiatives were taken uh, at the time. So I think, I think what is happening now is uh, the model which I'm describing for you, uh, which is that it is relentless capitalism. And I must also mention that a lot of people get tremendously confused about this term called Atam Nirbhar Bharat. A lot of people have, have been asking me, what does, it, uh, what does it mean? I mean, of course we can all translate that, but to translate in political terms, like people draw a line between Swadeshi and Atam Nirbhar, and, but you actually look at what, uh, what Atam Nirbhar Bharat is, it has nothing to do with Swadeshi, right? So uh, what you need to remember, or what we all need to remember is that how some of these old vocabulary is being repackaged, but actually when you open it up, it is literally relentless deregulation of the market. Does that take care? I mean, I, Rahul? You muted. Yeah, I'll, I'll unmute. Uh, are very, very, very important because uh, one of the things we must realize is that in 1991, one of the major conditionalities that the IMF and the World Bank gave was withdrawal of farm subsidy. Mm. And it never happened. So the power of the farming lobby was, uh, for good or bad or altruistic or materialistic reasons, was always recognized. Uh, Ashutosh Vashne uh, wrote a very important article about mass politics, where he argued that uh, India's economic reforms succeed when there are a few people who have to be taken on board. But when it becomes mass politics, like, you know, free electricity, you can't roll it back. When it becomes something like rolling back the fertilizer subsidy, you can't roll it back. But what we have actually begun to see is actually a much, much greater uh, and aggressive. Uh, and, uh, and in some senses, uh, Manmohan Singh and Varshne were right because, you know, the farmers movement has kind of been more resilient than any other kind of opposition that we have seen. Whether it will work or not is another question. The other thing is that um, with regard to, uh, it, it, it just crosses my mind. So maybe we should go to the question by uh, Rito Broto and then go come back to this, uh, uh, to this particular. The, the other thing, the other short point I wanted to make for your consideration is that we are doing some research on regulation and we've done some work on regulatory politics in India, which is fairly historically informed. We are actually beginning to see that crony capitalism of a different kind is emerging. And you know, the kind of research we do is almost like a historian's uh, or an anthropologist kind of research. I mean, even the regulators would know that we know about the sector that we are researching. Uh, political scientists may not acknowledge, but <laughs> anthropologists and historians like it. So the point I'm making is that 
it's not like there was no crony capitalism under UPA in sectors like telecommunications, increasingly in farms. But what we are beginning to see is a, is a different level of, and whether you can call that deregulation or, uh, or some kind of Marx's executive committee of the bourgeoisie, which he did not, may not have defined that well, uh, is, a, is a progression of humongous uh, sort of uh, proportions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and I, but, but we take your point that, you know, the general direction is kind of in that, uh, in that uh, so if you don't want to respond to those comments, then it is Rito Broto who had his hand up for a very long time. Uh, our apologies. Please come on in, Rito Broto. No issues, Rahul. Yeah, thank you for this um, session. It was very good. Actually, I wanted to ask one thing regarding the current scenario. Mm -hmm. I will just uh, state a few things about the farm bill. Last year also, India saw this kind of protest in the anti and NRC one, but after some time, that that protest was also losing the momentum in terms of the biasness of the people. But I think two months down the line, this farm uh, farmers movement is still continuing on because I have a feeling that in a very long time, India is seeing a class based protest rather than a religious one. And that's why the government is not able to play the divide card. And regarding this authoritarian uh, principle of the governments, isn't it, it kind of synonymous over like 50 years when there is like uh, less uh, dissent that is allowed among the oppositions, the economy tend to fall? Isn't, isn't this a proportional kind of an idea? Hmm. and you can forgive me for my terminology i am an it consultant i am not uh, related to this field anyway uh, but i joined this uh, seminars for the interest of uh, it thank you for joining the seminar yes ravinder the floor is yours I think uh, you have asked very important questions about, uh, I think the last point, uh, especially that you made about the correlation between, if I you know, the kind of um, stability or some sort of harmony, social harmony, that uh, what, what kind of correlate, could you repeat that last point, please? Uh, yeah, if like government always tries to suppress it, no matter how strong they are, the uh, economy always suffers. Okay, well, I think the the thing about um, if you look at these, uh, there are many different ways in which even free market economies are organized around the world. And some of the examples that, uh, you know, here in Europe, uh, there is particular kind of, you know, uh, I mean, I am sitting in Denmark, which a lot of people, I think, sort of misunderstand what uh, the Nordic model is all about. This is, this is free market capitalism, but at the same time, it is uh, joined together, uh, you know, with a, with a degree of uh, social welfare, which probably does not exist anywhere else, right? So this is one model they have figured out. Um, and um, so, in, so in American elections, they continue talking about Danish socialism, which is like, I think most people laugh about that. So the point is that yes, uh, free market or market itself or trade uh, exchange can thrive where there is also social harmony. And these are choices one makes. But I think in India, what we are witnessing is that uh, economy or the whole discourse of uh, economic reforms has been appropriated by RSS BJP and in a different way to the Congress. So what I'm trying to say is it's the same project of economic reforms, but the to the end, the end to which it has been turned by the BJP government under Modi is of different proportion. It is literally seen as a fuel, you know, fuel to the project of Hindutva which will allow it to do some dramatic changes to the society. What, uh, uh, I don't know, I hope you, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you can see what I'm trying to say, that uh, there seems to be some sort of emergency, some sort of uh, 
like as if things cannot wait that during the pandemic itself some very fundamental decisions have been taken uh, like steps have been taken things which had to be accelerated so what i'm trying to describe here is that there are many ways in which free market and the politics uh, you know the liberal politics uh, can can be shaped but in this case it seems that um, you know economic reforms discourse or the whole practice has been appropriated towards an entirely different end and uh, if one were to be cynical and to also take up an earlier point from the discussion uh, which i think Pr prale was talking about do investors care what happens in a country like where they are going to put investments the sad answer is no which is uh, that uh, it's a very short term kind of thinking that uh, you know every day when you read newspapers you see well the stock market is doing fine the the sentiments you know the stock market is seen as a being with sentiments and emotions right as long as the sentiments of the stock market continue to do fine it seems like nothing else matters so once that kind of economic argument begins to take precedence which is which is what is happening in many parts of the world uh, then i think uh, it is okay and just to say this is not an indian situation condition altogether during trump's regime uh, you know the um, american discourse has been but look he's creating jobs he's given tax cuts we can deal with him right now if there is some sort of introspection going on or there is some sort of shock in american politics it is because they actually could see that the entire edifice that they have built upon you know built of democratic uh, you know government that is about to fall apart if you remember it is just three nights ago right that uh, you know that people were saying well is it a coup going on a coup attempt now we can all do the post mortem right but the thing is it came so close and all of a sudden then the rhetoric you was to pull back i have seen that happening in europe also it has happened in germany in denmark in many other places where when the far right completely is going to about to take you over then i have seen that people say nope maybe then the point would be that there are actually different gradations of the ways in which democracy itself is seen uh you know that uh, tech companies for example a lot of people are remarking that how swiftly they have taken um, you know some actions which were undermining the american democracy whereas the same facebook as everyone knows is deeply entwined with the government structure within india and uh, uh, yesterday there was a hashtag on twitter i stand with kapil mishra now everybody who knows kapil mishra they know what that hashtag was about right so trump was silenced by the big tech uh but they would not do that uh in india i don't know if that long winding answer say something to you ah uh, yeah it it does it Great. does now uh since we are uh, moving in a certain direction with respect to time i will summarize two questions and then i will also request some very senior scholars who are participating in this uh, in this lecture to comment if they want to come in uh we have uh, in audience uh, john harris ole tonquist steven wilkinson and uh, and and hans harder has has been there right from the very beginning but he has not spoken so i i will i will invite these scholars to uh, uh to comment uh, before before that happens uh i just want to underline two questions one is by i think by mufassir emil this is the last question this is about the constitution and this is about this argument about whether hindutva goes against the constitution or not and why have such arguments in the in the academia but why is in the judiciary taking it seriously this is one and then there is another question by sakshi garg which is about uh majoritarianism uh, uh, uh and does 
uh, should the state conduct its activity on majoritarianism or should should on the constitution uh, then why aren't we seeing that legal that what's happening uh, yeah sakshi is saying yeah uh, opening up of 1991 has widened the gap between the majority and the minority does it mean that open market has made minorities more vulnerable in the market is there any evidence hmm. uh, this then there is mufassir emil ritobrato uh, um, uh, <laughs> steven says that i got the timing wrong and therefore i got, came in late but uh, hi steven it's uh, it's really wonderful that you could make it it's always a pleasure to see you uh, so the floor is yours and then we can request uh, hans john and ole if uh, if they want to come in with their because i did see them uh, in audience for quite some time yeah so the floor is yours to begin with then i will invite them uh, okay one. so i think uh, the question that sakshi is asking i'll begin with that and uh, i think first of all i must say that even though we are speaking about the history of economic reforms what was happening during upa is very different from what is happening under modi uh, rule and by that i mean that uh, economic reforms in itself did not marginalize the minorities uh the discourse was very different which is that uh, what mattered mattered was not so much your religion at that point i mean i don't have I, mean, i can show you lots of um, evidence actually also images which uh, uh, the argument had become little bit like the new liberal argument of self making right so actually india shining campaign um and some of uh, some of the other imagery had uh, muslim imagery which was about that here you too can be you know like an entrepreneur who's a muslim who's a weaver but who has set up his own shop or something like that so i think there was a potential for minorities to stake a claim to belong to the nation but the basis of that belonging was economic right so that is one sort of argumentation but i think in this new setup in the last 6 years that itself has been opened it so uh, what i'm trying to say is that it's not like that these things uh, could not have been any different of course they could have been different and they were different but they have become this way that um, uh, majoritarianism is being entrenched on the back of economic growth and of course the biggest surprise the puzzle of these six years is that actually economic growth has stalled and it has actually gone downwards right and that is something that i'm actually writing on to explain this puzzle that how is this possible that uh, you know such a paradox can even exist but the point being that uh, what keeps alive the modi government is that he has strong backing from what is called india inc and actually there is a chapter in my book which i simply call the magical market uh, where i'm describing the state uh, and capital relationship right and that why uh, despite all evidence to the contrary that actually it is mon mohan singh's government which was uh, not very loud not very you know spectacular but it was doing the work and i think they were more and more uh, shaping up a form of capitalism as i mentioned capitalism with a human face that they were trying to derive a particular way of market right which which uh, coheres with the society and recognizing that there are severe problems here but this project that we are witnessing uh, has been set in a different way again to say it did not have to be like this but it is like this and that has to do with the fact that the old model gujarat model has been aggressively expanded and projected onto india great so uh, so then uh, uh, may i request hans if if you have any comments 
Yes, uh, thanks a lot, Raoul, for inviting me to comment. I have just a very small comment, plenty of questions, but I won't raise them now. This small comment is just about the role of the Sikhs, the role of the Sikhs in Indian self-representation, because my feeling is that notwithstanding the Khalistan movement, Bindran Wali and all that historical background, the Sikhs have always been very iconic in Indian self-representation, out, especially outside of India, right? And uh, especially if you talk about exotica, this exotic image of India has often been conveyed by the figure of Sikhs. So um, you asked us to, to raise this question of how, uh, what, is, what sort of in, in inhabitants do you find on the surface of uh, the nation brand? So how do the, the Sikhs fare on this surface? No, you know, surprisingly, I have never thought about this. <laughs> and this is despite the fact I'm a Sikh myself. I literally have never, ever thought about this. Uh, but when I look at all that imagery, actually Sikhs don't appear. And the form of Indian, like the Indian, the, the presentable Indian, um, you know, some of the images that I showed you, in a way, they were very de-resonated de imagery, right? Like a lot of it is like a lot of things have been stripped off. Mm -hmm. okay? okay? And also, I'm telling you of some of the broader trends. And I also told you that um, of all that imagery in the name of difference, what does appear is Taj Mahal, for example. Or there are, and that too, what I'm saying, it's not necessarily because of secular ethos, but rather that you simply cannot, you know, put forth India imagery without putting forth Taj Mahal because that's the biggest revenue generator. So it is actually the economic logic which allows the difference to, uh, to be present. Uh, and in the same way, the economic logic is what also allows minorities to be present, but speaking about specific Sikh imagery, I haven't come across anything. And I'm thinking because there is not one campaign. India, you know, Incredible India is the most famous one. India Chinese, like I am scanning through, but I I haven't come across anyone. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. So yeah. I think you must complain now that you have. Yes. Uh... <laughs> and then, and then I have then I have a snide remark to make, mm -hmm. which is that you know it was these two Sikhs. Dr. Manmohan Singh and Mr. Montek Singh Aluwalia, <laughs> who did a lot of the work that you are talking about. Exactly. And, yes. and in fact, in fact, uh, one senior bureaucrat close to uh, Darsimha Rao at that time uh, said that everything is fine with uh, with this team, but just just remember that these are two Sikhs. Mm. And uh, apparently, Narsimha Rao's reply was that. Well, there are two Hindus everywhere. <laughs> so what is the problem if there are two Sikhs? Yeah. And I think there is a little bit of, uh, I think, uh, controversy which uh, often happens that who should get the credit for the reforms? You know, I'm sure all of you are aware of that. When uh, Vinay Sitapati wrote this book, where he mentions that it's, it is Narsimha Rao, uh, you know. Well, who... I have a very strong view on that. And I will not impose it on you right now. <laughs> <laughs> and that is all you have to do is to go back and look at the archives and, uh, you know, that simply doesn't hold. But there, were, there has been an attempt, uh, you know, how strong, strongly we should give credit to Manmohan Singh or not. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think the next person whom I would like to invite is uh, John Harris. Uh, John, are you still there? John, can you hear us? Uh, I can see his name. I can see his name. I think he's hiding somewhere. This is all a... He's, <laughs> yeah, he, okay. <laughs> he, he, he just sent me a mail. I, I haven't seen the mail. I haven't read the mail, but he just sent it. So we must hide away. We will wait for John to come. Wonderful, lovely to see you, Ole, uh, in person. And uh, hopefully you will visit us in Heidelberg soon when the, when the virus... But while while you're waiting for John, if he pops up again, <laughs> can, can, I, can I ask a, 
I mean, sure, sure, sure. We're waiting for your question. I just thought that. I, thank you, Ravinder. For I, I'm excited by this. I, I'm just wondering, uh, would it make sense, do you think, to to sort of relate these developments that you that you account for to 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 a longer historical perspective? If we go back to the discussion about liberal economics and and liberal politics, uh, you know, in the in the 60s and 70s, we 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 then had a downturn from the second wave of democracy, the anti-colonial wave of democracy, and we and we we ended into we entered into what 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 Huntington was calling the politics of order, and 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 that was primarily then the argument that we need a strong state first, we need strong political institutions. Okay, and then came the third wave and now come Fukuyama back. Mm. He, he reversed of course, but then he realized he said that, yeah, shit, uh, Huntington was right all the time. So now we need the state back again, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is his, his, his message. Uh, okay, now and that 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 is very much what's happened. Type Singapore and 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 China and all that, and and some other places. But now India is not really like that. It's a more populist. Uh, it's a more populist strong state that is that is sort of entering into this. This is how I I sort of think of it. And and if you go to Duterte in the Philippines, you have a more sort of oligarchic. Uh, mode of that. It's not the strong state that Huntington was was asking for. Uh, that reminds more of, of the emergency in India, but this is, but this is still a strong uh, nation state, kind of, but with, you know, with, with populist means. Uh, would it make sense to, to, to sort of, you know, frame, uh, to use this wider framework for, for reading uh, the Indian developments that you have told us about. Could you be more like, could you say a bit more, I mean, like in terms of strong state? Um... Well, the, the, the argument, well, the original argument was of course that there would be need for strong political rules and regulations, strong institutions as it, as it were. Uh, uh, in, in this case, I presume it's, it's, it's more a kind of, coherence mm. uh, that that is at the at the core of the argument you mm. they would argue you know we can't have democracy without a a coherent political uh, framework mm. and 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 if that can be built i presume with with well with with a movement based nationalism as as modi is, is standing for. I mean, he it's a huge movement, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as compared to Duterte or, or something, then 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 it would then it would fit into that picture. I think. I think uh, this thing about state. I mean, as we all know, there's uh, there has been uh, you know different moments, uh, you know, where state was seen as unwelcome guest at some point and at other times seen as a very um, as a very important actor uh, from developmental politics and down to neoliberal uh, economics. Now, the point is irrespective of these different moments, state has always been there. And I think this is uh, the rhetoric apart. Uh, I mean, and talking about Fukuyama, the thing is, a lot of people say a lot of things, but not everybody's taken seriously. The thing about Fukuyama was and is that uh, he continues to be taken seriously. In the last chapter of my book, I actually engage with Fukuyama's latest offering, which namely, which speaks about identity politics, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I think the problematic part in all of this is that even when all this, you know, this notion that uh, we are moving into a condition where the free market takes care of itself, right? I mean, at the height of all this kind of rhetoric, even then state has been a strong actor. 
So what I'm trying to say is that uh, what we may, maybe we have to turn attention to is what was actually happening and why some of these very influential projects of theory making actually were not really doing much. And the book that I have written, I've been surprised and puzzled myself as like most people, I have grown up as a student, uh, you know, learning like in this whole moment of globalization, right? 1990s, this is the time, you know, I passed school in, in 1989, I entered university at that time. So the whole world was opening up. But what you realize when you look back and go into the archive is that uh, state has been a tremendously important actor, no matter what these policy think tanks tell you, right? And, uh, and uh, the very very project which I'm describing for you, it is actually undertaken by the state. Few people know that uh, the whole project uh, that I'm describing for you, it is actually undertaken by the Ministry of Commerce in partnership with Confederation of Indian Industries. It is not happening uh, you know, through private actors. It is actually a state operation. Most of the investment programs, they are state operations. Right. So what I'm just trying to dispel is that uh, it is high time, even though it is pretty obvious and plainly inside, we need to say that again and again, that the idea that there is anything called free market is a lie. All markets are regulated, depends on how much they are regulated. It's, it's I mean, everybody knows this, but it, it bears repeating. So I think in that sense, uh, the thing about it also depends on how we interpret what strong state really is all about. Strong, some people would say that strong state is which is actually working in an efficient manner for you know, social welfare, right? And uh, some would say that strong state also comes with a rhetoric which, uh, which uh, requires you to demonize everybody else, right? And we have those examples too. So I think, uh, in India, um, right from Nehruvian times, even within the developmental project, state always has been pretty strong, right? I mean, there are reams written about the developmental state. So I think, uh, I don't know if it makes sense. Yeah, it, it makes sense, but I do think that there are, as you say, there are different ways of building a strong state. Mm. So, so, you know, I mean, they, 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 there was this argument for quite some time, supported by, by Fukuyama, among others, uh, that, that it would be possible to have a sufficiently strong state by liberal means, mm. by liberal politics. And now we've seen a, a return to the argument that, that, that non-liberal uh, politics, more not very democratic politics, is sort of needed. And, and that's where I think sort of your story fits into that, that wider argument, which we note all around, more or less, but that the Indian particularity is its strong populist uh, element and movement-based element. And there are many diff different models that one can go towards. Uh, mm. I think India has been, I think we have to think in the broader context also of, you know, Asia as such, where mm -hmm. actually Singapore, surprisingly, it's a very small state, but for many policy uh, makers, I mean, I have conducted loads of interviews with uh, people who do policy and without fail, they always mention, mention Singapore. So, so surprisingly, uh, Singapore has become a model which everyone wants to emulate. I mean, Rahul has lived in Singapore, so he can regale us with I, what I, I, I not only lived in Singapore, but I also wrote a piece called On the Developmental State in India when I was living in Singapore. Oh. And that did not change my mind about India or about the developmental state. <laughs> uh, but point, I think this is a very important question. And I don't know whether John is here to ask uh, uh, make the last few comments. John, are you present to make another few comments? If not, I think we are kind of moving towards the end. And I just want to end with uh, a remark on politics and political science. Uh, Ole and I uh, and a lot of my colleagues are <laughs> happen to be uh, sort of a part of that uh, intellectual movement. 
but political science I find is also very political because uh, when the Cold War ended, uh, that was the time when uh, Fukuyama was talking about the end of history and this very liberal way of uh, bringing about uh, transformations. And we really didn't think at that time that you need a strong state because for Fukuyama, you know, United States had reached the end of history. Mm -hmm. Whereas now with uh, Trump in power uh, and even before Trump, uh, Fukuyama seems to have made, uh, you know, changed his mind. He probably begins to think that the United States should look more like China. So, uh, so in many ways, and I can tell you that the entire literature literature on democratic transitions does not at all take India seriously. Uh, it's all about Latin America and East Asia, because those were the countries that were closer to the United States at the time of the Cold War. So I think this question that Ola has ra raised uh, also uh, sort of speaks to the political nature of the discipline of political science. Uh, so thank you very, very much, uh, Ravinder, for exciting so many of us to engage with you and thank you all. And especially, uh, you know, my Hans, Ola, John, uh, Stephen, of course, my colleagues, uh, Himanshu, Hossein, Jay, who helped me manage this, Tanvi, Ronia and Mia. Uh, and thank you all for making this such a lively discussion. And I hope you will help us keep this discussion lively. And many of the people who are asking questions will also present their work uh, in the forthcoming sessions of this colloquium. So thank you very much. Well, I think I want to say thank you to everyone who has been here. It has been really, really uh, very stimulating discussion and there is so much to talk. Rahul, thank you so much and colleagues at Heidelberg and everyone who has asked questions. So here's wishing the South Asia <laughs> community in Europe come together, connect more with South Asia. Thank you very much and a very happy new year. See you all. Bye-bye. <laughs>